Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone. And welcome to this United States Studies Centre webinar. My name is Susanna Patton and I am a research fellow in the Foreign Policy and Defence Programme. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. The University of Sydney stands on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country which you are on and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd like to say a few words of introduction to our webinar today and then introduce our panel of speakers before turning it over to them for their introductory comments. We'll have time for questions from the audience at the end, so please submit any questions in the chat box. At the 70th anniversary of ANZUS, which is on 1 September, we thought it would be timely to tackle one of the thornier questions about Australia's alliance um, with the US, which is how it affects our relationships with the countries in our immediate neighbourhood in Southeast Asia. This is, of course, just one dimension of the cost benefit analysis of an alliance, but it's an important one to reconsider in 2021, especially as Australia is considering new initiatives with the US, which could deepen our security ties um, with the alliance. Australia has always maintained that the US alliance is an asset to its standing in Asia, making a contribution to regional security and helping embed a strong US presence in the region. Um, yet, I think most observers would agree with the benefit of hindsight that it may not always have been seen this way. And various incidents, various incidents, especially during the early 2000s, suggested that some countries in our region thought our relationship with the US either distracted us from focusing enough on building ties in Asia, or that our security cooperation with the US was in some measure targeted at the region. However, much has changed since then, especially in terms of the regional security environment. So how is the Alliance seen today in 2021? We have a great panel of regional security and foreign policy experts, and importantly, all of them have strong ties to Australia, which is very helpful for our discussion today. So I'll introduce our speakers in turn. Um, First is Sharaman Lockman, Director in the Chief Executive's Office of the Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Malaysia. Sharaman is also an Australian alumnus holding a Master's in Strategic Affairs from the Australian National University. Um, secondly, Dr. Sarah Teo, Assistant Professor and Coordinator of the Regional Security Architecture Program at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Sarah holds a PhD from the University of Sydney and has written on Australia's place in Asia in Australian foreign affairs. Finally, Dr. Evan Laxmana is the Wang Gongbu Visiting Fellow at ICS in Singapore and was previously a senior researcher at CSIS Indonesia. Evan's PhD is from Syracuse University, so he is not an Australian alumnus, but he spent extensive time here having held visiting positions at the Lowy Institute and University of Sydney. So I would like to start out by asking each of our panelists to give some introductory remarks on the way Australian foreign and strategic policy, in particular our choice to ally with the United States, is seen in their country and in the region more broadly in 2021. Does the US alliance add to or diminish Australia's influence and standing? So I'll turn first to Sharaman, then to Sarah, and then to Evan. Over to you, Sharaman. All right, thanks very much, Susanna. Um, so let, let me just make very two uh, very quick uh, points, uh, two quick points. Essentially, number one is that I think uh, for the most part, Southeast Asians do not quite understand, will probably never quite understand uh, the depth of the relationship between Australia and the US. And that as a result, they will tend to make very um, sort of like uh, very quick conclusions about Australia and America and make some very, uh, very uh, sweeping uh, conclusions like, oh, this is about Eurocentrism and all that. You know, I mean, the, 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 the thing that I learned about the, the alliance when I was in Australia, uh, you know, sitting uh, uh, at the feet of you White essentially, was that uh, this is very much, um, you know, embedded, deeply embedded in the Australian identity, the, the arrival of the Great White Fleet in, you know, 1909, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the curtain speech, you know, the task ahead speech in 41, which was, you know, things that are really monumental to the history of Australia. Yeah, and, and we, 
you know, in South Asia, I do not think that many countries in South Asia have this kind of relationship with a, with an extra regional power. You know, so you have you know like the Vietnam War, um, that that iconic image of those Australian troops, you know, just waiting to get onto American helicopters. Uh, you know, that that is that, that is the depth to which uh, the the alliance defines uh, 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 the Australian identity for certain sections of the uh, uh, Australian community. Obviously, not everyone agrees. So yeah, as as a result, you know, people, you know, okay, I I, I had a I had a bet with a with a good friend of mine, Ewan Graham, that I wouldn't be the first one to say uh, deputy sheriff, but oh god, I've just lost, I've just lost that bet. Uh, so there is that that easy recourse, right? When you want to be nasty to Australia, you say that sort of stuff. So that tends to color a bit of the Australian uh, Asian perception towards towards Australia. But at the same time, and, and this goes to my second point, that there, there is no real uniform perception of Australia in South Asia. Let me just say that in Malaysia, for example, Australia is pretty much seen, despite what our previous leaders might have said, is seen as largely an independent actor. It, it is not seen within the context of, uh, of ANZUS. Rather, it's seen in the context of the five power defense arrangements. right? So we, we have a good relationship with Australia on that. We have a very extensive Malaysia-Australia joint defense uh, program where a lot of uh, Malaysian uh, officers are trained in, in Australia. We have something called Operation Gateway, which involves flying uh, 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 P-8 uh, Poseidons out of Batuworth in Penang to do uh, uh, maritime, patrol, maritime patrols in the Indian Ocean as well as in the South China Sea. So uh, when, 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 when I ask officials, diplomats, uh, military officers in in Malaysia, you know, if, if you see Australia, do you see the Americans behind them? Uh, the answer is no, no. Uh, do you do when I ask them, do you think that we ought to be closer to uh, to Australia so that we can influence what the Americans uh, we can influence the American approach towards the region? The answer is no. We are, Obviously not. I mean, we have our own relationship with the United States. Uh, in fact, we do more exercises with, with the United States than any other country. So yeah, um, I mean, you know, so th there is there is that that perception that Australia is a link to the Americans is quite not quite there. Do we need to be closer to the Australians so that we can tap into that uh, awesome intelligence of like uh, arrangement uh, uh, that Australia has with America, New Zealand, Canada, the United Kingdom? No. Uh, there is there is no such you know linkage being made within the Malaysian uh, strategic community. So I I I I think it is it is very much a mixed bag. On the one hand, yes, there is the perception that Australia is this country that is you know very much tied to the Americans. But in reality, the 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 actions of of Australia as you know as seen in the region and especially seen in Malaysia, it's it's not quite it's not seen as in as it. It's not seen as if you are sort of like tied to the uh, Americans of like um, coattails, you know. Yeah, let me just say that in terms of uh, economic relationships, I think Australia has pretty good, uh, very good arrangements with uh, ASEAN, the ANSFTA, the uh, ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. As far as extra regional uh, free trade arrangements are concerned for ASEAN, it's one of the more comprehensive ones. The rest are very much paper, in, uh, very nice to look at on paper, but not quite. Not, not, not particularly good when it comes to implementation. The Malaysia-Australia Free Trade agree, uh, uh, Agreement is possibly the deepest, most comprehensive free uh, FTA that Malaysia has with any uh, country, uh, including with its neighbors, to be honest. There is pretty much um, you know, frictionless uh, trade between um, Malaysia and Australia. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, perception and reality diverges greatly, I think, uh, when, when it comes to uh, Australia and its role in, in the region and, and perceptions of the ANZUS Treaty. I'll just stop there, if I may, uh, Susanna. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Sarah now. Thanks, Susanna. Um, I also do want to express my appreciation to the U and the USSC for the invitation to participate in this session. Uh, so I thought what I would do in the next five to seven minutes or so would just to kind of briefly share my responses to the three questions um, that were posed to us uh, in the panel synopsis, right? So first, um, how do Australia's neighbours understand the purpose of the alliance in 2021? 
Second is the alliance seen as limiting um, Australia's autonomy or enhancing its influence. And third, whether the alliance is seen as kind of distancing, uh, distracting Australia from engaging its neighbours or as contributing to regional security. Um, so before I start, I think I just want to echo Shariman's statement that I don't think there is a uniform view um, of Australia in Southeast Asia. Um, so of course, my responses will also be framed very much by where I'm located. So the, the very first um, uh, issue, you know, how uh, Australia's neighbours in Southeast Asia understand the purpose of the alliance today. So I think, you know, the very first thing, you know, that we should take note of is that I think fundamentally the function of the Australia-US alliance is to serve the security interests of both countries, right? So any initiatives taken under this umbrella um, should first and foremost be viewed through this lens. But as a side um, corollary in terms of how Southeast Asia views this relationship, I think it is quite clear that, that the alliance does contribute towards um, supporting and retaining US presence in this part of the world. Um, and I think this function is especially appreciated given that several of the Southeast Asian countries, um, including Singapore, have operated on the basis that having the US engaged in the region is necessary for Southeast Asian peace and stability. So, you know, I think we are all familiar with uh, uh, the many times that Singapore leaders have come out to, to urge the US to kind of maintain and strengthen its presence in the region. Um, and the assumption is that, you know, decades of US presence here have helped to create a, a conducive environment for, for peace and economic growth. And Singapore does hope for this scenario to continue. So I think naturally, um, the Australia-US alliance, just like all the other alliance relationships and partnerships involving Washington, is one significant dimension of retaining that presence. And this link, of course, you know, manifests in a variety of ways. So in the past, we have seen Australian initiatives like APEC, uh, you know, which, which kind of drew in the US to engage more deeply with the region uh, post-Cold War. Um, the Asia-Pacific community, I know it was not very welcomed uh, by Southeast Asia, but I would raise that as another example, because even though it didn't actually materialize, um, I would say that it contributed towards the debate that eventually saw the US uh, join the East Asia Summit in 2011. And of course, today, the purpose of the alliance has gone beyond the bilateral context, right? To include mini lateral platforms that help to strengthen uh, spoke to spoke relations. Um, so we are talking about things like the Quad, um, as well as the various uh, uh, initiatives or mechanisms involving countries like Australia, Japan, um, and, and the US. So I think overall from Southeast Asia's view, uh, the alliance is valued for its contributions in that sense, right? Towards maintaining that balance uh, of the various external presence, powers presence in Southeast Asia. So going on to the second question, is the alliance seen as limiting Australia's autonomy or enhancing its influence? So I don't think that those two are necessarily uh, mutually exclusive, um, but I would probably lean more towards the argument that the alliance actually does enhance Australia's influence in the region. Um, so it's, it's somewhat, I think, of, of a counterfactual example, you know, because we can't really test it. But I think without the US alliance, it would be a bit more difficult for Australia to be regarded as a major player in Asia, right? I mean, geographical distance is one factor. Um, and Australia, it does invest and contribute towards, um, you know, capacity building or infrastructure building of the ASEAN member states. But I think in quantitative terms, if you look at the numbers, it can't really compete head to head with countries like China and Japan. So on its own, I think Australia's influence in the region may be limited. Uh, and in that sense, I think the alliance does help to magnify Australia's influence in the region because it is a US ally. Um, it has a chance or opportunity to participate in arrangements like the Quad uh, to pursue greater um, spoke to spoke relations with other US allies and so on. And, you know, again, part of that importance, you know, comes from Australia's efforts in, in ensuring that the US remains engaged with the region. So finally, the third question, um, whether the alliance is seen as distracting Australia from engaging its neighbours or contributing to regional security. Um, so I would say it's a bit of both in the sense that, you know, we have seen both cases, right? We have seen the alliance distancing Australia from, from some of its Southeast Asian neighbours, uh, but we have also seen Australia um, contributing to regional security in its own ways. Um, so, and... You know, when I talk about Australia uh, uh, being distant, I think from, from some of the Southeast Asian counterparts. So here I'm referring to examples like uh, the debate that surrounded uh, Australia's signing of, of uh, ASEAN's Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in the mid-2000s. Uh, I think Susanna 
made a reference to that uh, period as well. Um, and also, I think the fact that Australia's approach on several issues, uh, ranging from counterterrorism to to even issues like you know um, Israel's capital in 2018, have aligned with the US um, and have been criticized by some of its Southeast Asian counterparts. On the other hand, uh, the alliance has also contributed to regional security. So I've earlier outlined those contributions, so I, I'm not, I will repeat those. Um, I will just add one more point, which is that I think regardless of the alliance, Australia remains an important partner for some Southeast Asian countries as well as for ASEAN. So in the current circumstances, uh, for example, you know, we have seen quite a lot of uh, media coverage or discussion uh, about the Quad's pledge right, to deliver, I think, 1 billion COVID vaccines to Southeast Asia by, by the end of 2022, challenges uh, notwithstanding. Um, but beyond that, you know, Australia on its own is also offering assistance to Southeast Asian countries like Indonesia and Laos. Um, and it has also committed to investing um, in the new ASEAN Centre for Public Health Emergencies uh, and Emerging Diseases to strengthen uh, ASEAN resilience. So what I, what I think it means, you know, taking all these uh, trends and, and developments in, into consideration, um, what I think it means is that even if Australia, you know, cannot match up in terms of resources or influence vis-a-vis -vis the major powers, Australia does offer an alternative among several others uh, for countries that are looking to diversify their foreign relations a bit. And I think that does reflect a very useful value proposition, given that most, um, if not all, of the regional countries are looking for a way to keep their balance and even uh, reduce their reliance on the major powers. So on that note, I will end. Um, thank you, and I look forward to hearing everyone's views. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Evan to round out the introductory remarks. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, let me say thank you as well uh, to the U.S. Study Center uh, for having me back. Um, I'll just be very quick. Uh, there's three sets of questions I think uh, we're discussing. One, uh, simply, what is the uh, the purpose or what's uh, what's good and bad about um, the alliance from an Indonesian perspective? Um, what happens uh, if Indonesia's uh, bilateral relationship with Australia kind of have a divergent? Uh, set of trends when it comes to regional challenges, and we'll talk about a bit more about what's next. First, uh, sort of the plus and minuses of the alliance from, an, uh, from Jakarta standpoint. Uh, the plus side, sure, I think in the past, Australia's relationship with the US through the alliance uh, can be handy from time to time uh, in terms of military relationship. For example, when we had troubles uh, with regards to military exercises and training, uh, we turned to Australia's help to smooth things over with the US. But that was at a time when things were bad between us and the US. Now that things are good between us um, and the US, uh, this part uh, of, of, of the utility of the alliance uh, may be less important. Uh, secondly, of course, the alliance also uh, in a broad sense keeps uh, the U.S. engage uh, in this part of the Indo-Pacific, uh, and of course, uh, it may be useful for some types of, of regional contingencies. Uh, but I'll speak about this uh, later on in terms of the contingencies um, uh, later. Uh, but sort of the, uh, the downside of the alliance uh, uh, from Indonesia's standpoint is that Australia will always be seen as part of the U.S. efforts uh, to challenge China, for good or for bad. Uh, but uh, if you look at uh, some sectors of the Indonesian establishment, uh, they would say that part of the alliance is not good because any effort to raise regional tension is certainly not um, uh, welcome. Uh, secondly, uh, Shariman mentioned about uh, uh, the deputy sheriff. I just wanna highlight that who sets the agenda in the alliance, I think will always be an enduring question. How do we know uh, that what Australia is proposing is Australia's agenda versus it's the US's agenda? And that will always be a big question mark. And of course, uh, lastly, any form of alliance is inherently exclusionary, right? So there's always gonna be debates about who gets in or out of that, uh, 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 that network and that alliance uh, will always be a key question. Uh, second question, uh, which I think is important mostly uh, for Indonesia and Australia, I think right now, uh, the bilateral relationship between Australia and, um, and Indonesia uh, at its highest point economically, uh, politically, and security uh, relationship, I think are, are very robust over the last five, six years or so. Uh, but we haven't been really tested uh, at the regional level. Uh, and by that, I mean, what happens when uh, Australia's regional priorities uh, 
are different than Indonesia's regional priorities. And I can imagine three areas in which uh, that might happen. Firstly, obviously, is China. Indonesia will never see China the way Australia sees China and vice versa. Um, secondly, in terms of regional priorities, Indonesia set of bilateral priorities with Australia as well as its regional priorities are always very uh, uh, inward looking and, and to some extent uh, low key. Uh, but what happens when uh, the US and Australia have a different set of regional priorities in the areas of technology, uh, South China Sea or other issues um, and whether or not Indonesia can be part of this, uh, uh, this effort to address regional challenges. And of course, thirdly, in terms of the role of external parties uh, to the region, I think Australia and the US would welcome the role, for example, of the UK or other European powers, while Indonesia is probably uh, less, uh, less willing to embrace uh, the more the merrier idea in this particular sense. Uh, so what's next? Uh, I think firstly, it's good uh, that the Australian um, a partnership and alliance uh, remain strong, uh, but there's no need to sell the alliance more than it is. It's good for Australia, uh, keep it that way. The more Australia tries to expand uh, uh, the strategic usefulness or utility of the alliance, the more the region is, is a bit uh, hesitant to embrace. Uh, the idea of that somehow the alliance supports the rules-based order, for example, it just rings hollow. Nobody's uh, seriously considering the rules-based order as a uniform uh, principle across the board anyway. And of course, uh, uh, while it's important to keep the alliance and it's, it serves Australia's purpose, uh, maybe once in a while consult the region a bit better when certain moves are, are being discussed, including, for example, the rotational uh, troops to Darwin. Uh, secondly, it's great that Australia is also investing in non alliance uh, partnership options with Indonesia, with ASEAN and others. And I think that's uh, certainly a good signal, but uh, the idea that somehow Australia will always be independent of the US will never go away. And it's fine, it's just the way it is. Uh, the region accepts it as it is. Australia should also accept that the region will never be fully on board that the idea of Australia as fully independent from the US uh, will be forthcoming, particularly in the era of, of great power competition. Um, lastly, uh, if we accept that uh, Australia will never be fully independent uh, and that no matter what Australia does, uh, there will always be some hesitance and, and ambivalence across the region, then what's left is about figuring out some of the low key initiatives, uh, some of the long and, and, and difficult challenge of building practical cooperation, uh, regardless of whether or not it serves a wider uh, regional purpose. And, and I think to some extent, this is more of a strategic communication problem than a, a practical um, a cooperation problem. And with that, I'll, I'll end my talk and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much to each of you for those introductory remarks. And you've put a lot on the table for discussion. So for our audience members, please do submit your questions um, in the Q&A function and we'll get to as many as we can. But I thought maybe to start off the discussion, um, I might turn to a question that we had pre-submitted, which was about China. Evan, I think you've already covered off on the differences in the way that Australia and Indonesia see China, but I'd be interested, Sarah and Shariman, in your views on whether the emergence of a more assertive China in our region um, would be seen by regional countries as making a US presence more essential, more urgent, and therefore possibly adding to, I guess, the strategic logic of Australia, perhaps um, boosting its um, security ties with the US, seeing the US step up its presence um, through initiatives like the marine rotation um, in Darwin. Um, does the emergence of China sort of change the calculus in the way regional countries are seeing the US presence? Um, so I might ask you first, Sharaman, and then to Sarah. Thanks, uh, Susanna. Um, look, I, this is a difficult question because I think ultimately the uh, U.S. alliance, I'm sorry, the presence of the United States in Southeast Asia is seen as a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, I, mean, I, apolo I apologize to, to those who have heard me say this uh, many times. Essentially, this is the case. I mean, you know, the general presence of the United States is seen as stabilizing, provides a nice balance to the whole picture. 
but there are times when the specific instances of U.S. intervention or, or, or policies in the region make, make things very tricky for us. For example, let's say, uh, okay, in early June, there was, Malaysia was doing some drip, some drilling in the South China Sea. And, um, you know, I think it was uh, one of the, one of the U.S. aircraft carriers were sailing past by and all of a sudden, one of the destroyers that was accompanying that, 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 that U.S. aircraft carrier turned and approached a Malaysian oil and gas field, which we were drilling and all that. And the, the, the PRC was sort of like harassing us over it. That move attracted even more Chinese ships into the area. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so yes, the, it, it complicated the whole picture for us. Because it made, made, made it even more, you know, we, we, we were not sure whether whether the Americans would actually start to attract all these Chinese ships into an area that we would really rather not anyone pay attention to, you know. So that is the, the dilemma here. On the one hand, yes, it's it's it's, it's good that it, it keeps it keeps China honest when 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 the Americans are around, but at the same time, it 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 prompts the prompts the Chinese to be you know, more assertive uh, in, in some instances. So there is both a deterrence and a spiral thing going on at the same time. So whether Australia's relationship with the US would, would be seen as an asset in, when, when China becomes more and more uh, assertive? Yes and no. Okay, yes, in a sense, yeah, like, 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 like Sarah said, it helps to anchor Americans in the region. But no, when um, when when Australia is is seen as less than imp in, an independent as an actor, then it becomes a problem. When 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 Australia is seen as a mere proxy for the for America for, for America in the region, that is not useful. Australia needs to be seen as an independent actor with its own policies, with its own approaches towards China. Uh, uh, there have been times in the past when uh, uh, Australia. Engagement with Australia is seen as engaging with U.S. light, you know, like a like a like a light light beer, but but uh, you know, like American beer, basically. I'm sorry to put it that way, but uh, that is no longer the case. Simply because the uh, the Australian relationship with China has deteriorated deteriorated so dramatically that it's no longer seen as uh, a, a a light American beer sort of thing. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, that, that's my answer. It's really complicated. Thanks. Well, sorry, shall I jump in here? Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, I, I completely, I think I agree with Shariman. Um, it is a complicated uh, question. And, it, and I think there's a very fine line between having the US here as, as a force of um, uh, keeping a stable region versus um, kind of leading to more tensions and a conflict in the region. Um, I mean, for Singapore, I think the argument is not so much about whether the US should be here or not. I think it's very clear that that Singapore, um, Singapore's leaders and diplomats do value US presence here. The assumption that US presence here is ultimately good for the region. Um, but I think it, it's a lot of it, I think, is about shaping the narrative and the perception of how the U.S. is engaged in the region. Uh, and I think that's where um, Australia actually comes in because it can help to shape that narrative uh, in consultation with its Southeast Asian partners that you know, the U.S. and Australia are not just off doing their own things in Southeast Asia. They're actually uh, working together with Southeast Asian countries to make sure that whatever actions and policy, policies are being taken, they're actually things that you know, regional countries um, would benefit from and, and would appreciate. Thank you to Sarah and Sharaman for that. Evan, I might bring you back into the conversation. Sharaman touched on the way that Australia's uh, relationship with China is seen. And obviously we've seen a very substantial deterioration in that relationship over the last couple of years. 
Um, how do you think that's seen from Indonesia? What would Indonesia think when looking at the state of the Australia-China bilateral relationship? Um, uh, thank you, Susanna. I think that's also a, a bit of a difficult question because I think there's a few different layers uh, to the problem in Australia-China's relationship. On the one hand, I think from a strategic interest uh, standpoint, Indonesia is, is certainly uh, uh, concerned with the use, for example, of economic leverages as tools of coercion. Uh, but we are also, on the other hand, um, take lessons of what not to do uh, in our own relationship uh, with China uh, uh, for good or for bad. I think avoiding some of the difficult issues um, that we have with China over issues like Natuna, for example, um, by uh, citing the example of what could happen to Indonesia uh, based on Australia's example is not very useful uh, for Jakarta in my view. Uh, but we are uh, certainly watching uh, what's going on. The second layer in terms of the internal debate uh, within Australia, how to engage China is also something that uh, we're paying attention to. I think uh, there's always a difficult balance between at what point do you inflate the threat and you move down to issues with regards to racism uh, kind of rings to some of the concerns that we have in Indonesia about how an anti-China position in terms of policy uh, can be pushed towards anti-ethnic Chinese Indonesians uh, within Indonesia. So there are, I think, echoes of the difficulties of having a good China debate uh, in Australia as much as it's hard to have a good China debate in Indonesia. Uh, but I think overall, uh, there is a sense that we would not like to be in Australia's position. On the other hand, we also understand why and how Australia takes some of those issues. But this goes back uh, to the earlier question. Um, it's hard for us from the outside to fully understand if, if let's say there are five or 10 things that becomes an issue between Australia and China, which one of these five or 10 things are 100% Australia's interest and problem and which ones are carry over agenda from the US side. And this is something that I think uh, we're, we're weary about because over the years we have seen uh, Western diplomats coming to Jakarta raising issues that they deem is important to deal with China but very different from how we uh, uh, would like to deal with China. So I think these are kind of on the margins. I don't think it's central uh, to how we look at the debate, but um, they're certainly uh, being watched in Jakarta. Thank you for that. Um, I might turn now back to sort of questions about um, the way the US is seen. Um, we've had a question about um, the role of um, values in Australian and US foreign policy, but I think I might broaden that out to ask in general, um, how do you think the new US administration is being seen um, in Southeast Asia? Um, and, um, and then specifically to that question about the sort of democratic values narrative that we've seen in US policy. So I'll go, um, Sharaman, Sarah, and then Evan. So over to you, Sharaman. Right. So, sorry, the question is uh, on the democ democracy bit and new administration, right? Yeah. So, uh, new administration, I'm afraid uh, when it comes to uh, uh, rel official relations between uh, Malaysia and the United States uh, at the official level, there hasn't been much uh, movement there simply because uh, people are so distracted by COVID. My defense minister has yet to even have a phone call, even a 50-minute phone call with uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, even though it has been how many months since uh, the election, uh, election I mean, uh, uh, um, inauguration has happened. So, yeah, you know, uh, pandemic has really, really disrupted the, uh, uh, the, the, the management of the relationship. Um, it's very disruptive. Uh, so, you know, but at the same time, I think there's a bit of a, uh, there's a sigh of relief that we are we have the adults in charge again. Uh, whatever um, qualms we have about what they have done with regards to Afghanistan and so forth, put putting that, that aside, this is decidedly um, decidedly a more predictable uh, uh, administration, and uh, th there's some comfort in that regard. Uh, with regards to democratization, I think um, uh, that it is seen as a return to the 
to to you know, it's part for the cost for the United States to be doing this. Uh, the the Trump administration was seen as a bit of an aberration. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the uh, U.S. support for democratization is very obvious. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, the, the National Endowment for Democracy uh, supports many uh, uh, NGOs and all that. You know, um, uh, on 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 elections on. Um, you know, promoting uh, various things. So, you know, it's, it's, we, we haven't actually experienced a practical sort of like uh, stop to, to, to those kinds of programs, even during the Trump administration. You know, the, the president didn't talk very much about it, but the US government was doing very much, doing a lot in that, in that, in that, uh, in that, in that space. So, yeah, you know, it's just a matter of rhetoric. Well, I think um, uh, in terms of how the new U.S. administration is, is being seen uh, in this part of the world, I think, um, like Shariman said, there is a sense that this administration will bring a bit more stability. Um, uh, it will be a bit more predictable. Um, but of course, I think for the next year or maybe year or two, it will probably be very um, preoccupied with its own uh, domestic uh, issues. Um, I think from ASEAN's viewpoint, um, there is some hope that there will that the U.S. will show up more uh, at ASEAN, um, at ASEAN meetings and, and so on. So that could, that could be a, a good thing. Um, as for whether it will be kind of written or it will be driven by by its value a values based foreign policy, um, or like Shariman said, I think you know you expect that uh, from the U.S. And there's I know a lot of talk about forming like a club of dem democracies or like this coalition of democracies. But I think in this region, I, I don't see a significant uh, tilt in that direction yet. So I think it is still very much driven by interests and a uh, common interest, of course. Um, I think in general, we know that during the campaign, uh, you know, uh, Biden had to embrace a large coalition to win. So we know that the agenda will be all over the place and the focus would be on COVID uh, and the midterm election. So we're very much aware that uh, for the time being, there is no fundamental overhaul of, of, of the US's foreign policy and that's fine. Uh, but I think the problem with a values-based approach now is that uh, it, whether it's about democracy or human rights or something else, it always assumes and requires uh, credibility, consistency, and coherence. And I don't think the U.S. has any of these right now uh, to be uh, pushing for a values-based approach uh, to regional engagement. And it's certainly, um, as, as Shariman said, uh, we certainly welcome the return of some form of normalcy at the working level, uh, which we also mean to, uh, to be focusing more on our common interests and issues rather than just the U.S.'s issues with China, for example. So we, we would be hesitant to embrace a values-based approach, not only because the U.S. has no credibility on those, but also because how do we know those issues aren't meant uh, to be part of uh, the competition with China? And this is, I think, a, a, a key issue with a values-based approach. As Indonesia's experience uh, uh, with Bali Democracy Forum uh, ourselves have shown, you know, it's, it's meaningless uh, to push for these kinds of issues unless you don't fix your own problems at home. Uh, so while the U.S. Uh, fixes their own problems at home, uh, it'll be great if we can get back to the business of discussing common interests without uh, mentioning the word China in every five sentence. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Ian Hall at the Griffith Asia Institute, um, which I think is a good one for sort of broadening out the discussion a little bit. Um, and he says, thanks to all the presenters. I wonder if the panelists think that the answers we've heard from you would be the same if the panelists were located in Manila, Hanoi or Bangkok. In other words, can we talk about a unified Southeast Asian view of the US or Australia or the Alliance or China. Um, so I think that's an interesting question, um, you know, to what extent um, are Southeast Asian countries uh, diverging more from each other than perhaps was once the case. Of course, it's a region that's always been diverse, 
but is it becoming more diverse and perhaps uh, more divided? Might start out with you, Sarah, given that you're um, closely focused on ASEAN and multilateral issues, and then go back to Sharaman and Evan. Thank, thanks, Susanna, and thanks, um, Yen, for the question. Um, I think there are pockets uh, in Southeast Asia that are taking a more um, divergent view of, of you know, major power relations and how the region or how the future of the regional architecture should, should be like. Um, I mean, I, I think that there, I mean, at this moment, and actually I, I don't think there will ever be a unified view, a, a unified Southeast Asian view of, of the US, of Australia, uh, you know, of China, um, the relations of, of each Southeast Asian country, their foreign relations are very different. Um, you know, their interests are, are pretty much different. I think the only thing that maybe all 10 ASEAN member states can agree on pretty much is that we all want peace and stability, right? But how we define that and how we see ourselves getting there, I think it does differ a bit uh, uh, depending on, on who you ask. So I think that, you know, if, if as, as Ian mentioned in his question, if the panelists were located in Manila, Hanoi or Bangkok, I think the answers would probably be slightly different. Um, I mean, in general, we would agree that uh, we need both the US and China in the region and, and we probably don't want to choose. Um, but in terms of, I think, the weightage that, that we accord to, to each major power and how we view Australia and the alliance would not be exactly the same. Yeah. Susanna, I, 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 um, I think there's a difference even between Malaysia and Singapore. So let alone Malaysia and Hanoi and, and Manila, you know, um, essentially the same security space, Malaysia and Singapore, and yet we have such different um, approaches, you know, Mal the, the traditional Malaysian approach, which is actually eroding a bit, but, you know, there's still, there's still pockets of people, the, the Zotfan, uh, 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 um, people, you know, the zone of peace, freedom, neutrality, people, uh, uh, crowd, they, they, are, they are still strong in, in, in Malaysia. So they, they, their approach to problems about South Asia was, uh, okay, you know, you know what, we should get the major powers out of the, the region, as in don't, don't get themselves uh, too, too, too uh, uh, enmeshed in the region. But the Singapore approach tends to be, you know, let's enmesh everyone in the region. There's more of the ARF approach to, 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 to management of, of uh, uh, stability. So yeah, uh, there is difference there. Hanoi, famously uh, uh, different uh, kind of approach to Malaysia, Philippines and Brunei on the South China Sea, I think. Uh, Philippines may be moving back, back towards uh, uh, its old approach uh, when uh, Duterte leaves uh, office. Look, but I, I think the dividing line between, it's, it's not a question of, do, do, do I see China as a threat or not? Do I see China as going to be aggressive or not? I think the dividing line is, do we accept that China's rise is inevitable, inexorable, unstoppable? I think the ones that, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that, that believe that it is inexorable, unstoppable, inevitable, those are the ones that are going to be more likely to essentially shift towards the Chinese orbit and say, yeah, okay, we, that, we, we can't do anything about it. Just, let's, just, just, let's just recognize, who, let recognize who's boss. Right. Uh, there are some pockets within Singapore, I think, within Philippines, Indonesia, who may be more inclined to say, look, th this is probably not inevitable. And therefore, we, uh, we can do something about it. We, have, we still have agency. We still have time. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's no longer a question about whether we like China, we like China or not. You know, I think uh, we all recognize it's a mixed bag. There's a lot to like. There's a lot to dislike as well. It's the dividing line is, is, is the Chinese dominance inevitable or not? And in Malaysia, there is a big debate there still. Um, yeah, but, but, uh, but you can see that, that it's leaning towards the, the, the notion that it's inevitable. Um, I think there is an interesting implicit assumption in that question about 
a unified view uh, across Southeast Asia, as, as Sarah and, and Ray said earlier, uh, it seems unlikely that's ever going to happen. But why do we need to have a unified view to begin with uh, for the U.S. to engage uh, Southeast Asia? Uh, the U.S. is a great power, so naturally, uh, they would like it if a complicated region can be simplified for them to engage. But that's not the case. Uh, I think um, each and every uh, Southeast Asian member certainly have their own specific interests, their own agency uh, to decide what's good or, or bad for them. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, should not assume that there can be a unified view uh, across Southeast Asia and that the U.S. should uh, develop and spend more resources to, uh, to explore a calibrated approach to individual Southeast Asian countries. Um, but are there common themes, kind of lowest common denominator issues uh, 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 in which all can agree on, as, as Sarah said? Um, uh, certainly, uh, there is something about uh, regional peace and stability. Uh, there's certainly uh, something about uh, the role of ASEAN, and there's certainly something about uh, 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 keeping both superpowers engaged, uh, whether in terms of economic or security. I think those are very uh, lowest common denominator uh, themes across the board, but that's not very useful, I think, uh, uh, to, uh, to develop a more specific calibrated approach, whether for the US and Australia. And unfortunately, what the US thinks works for Australia cannot be, uh, what the US thinks uh, would work uh, for its engagement to, to Indonesia will not work uh, with its engagement to Singapore or Malaysia or, or the Philippines. So yes, there are common themes, uh, but if it's talking about specific uh, approaches to different countries, I think the US and Australia should accept uh, that they should develop a more specific calibrated approach and not assume that uh, a unified response to anything is something that they should strive towards. Thank you. Um, Sharaman, you alluded to, um, I think you put it as um, sort of pockets of hesitancy in Malaysia about the role of outside powers or external powers and the role that they play in Southeast Asia. Um, we've had a question that goes to um, the possible um, sort of increase, I suppose, in external partner engagement um, in Southeast Asia, and that's from Huang Li Tu at ASB, and she says, hi all, good to see all of you. Um, my question refers to additional partners in the equation, especially the UK, the newest ASEAN dialogue partner. Um, if you put the UK next to Australia and the US in a regional cooperation agenda, for example, on maritime security, you know, how would this be seen by Southeast Asian countries? I might, um, might go Sharaman first on that question and then Sarah and Evan, if you would like to weigh in. Uh, so we are used to having the, the Brits around uh, because of the five power defense arrangement. So that's, that's, uh, it's an easy thing for us to swallow. Um, they, used, they used to run the shop here anyway, so we are quite comfortable with that. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's, there is that hesitancy. It's like, okay, what are they able to do? Uh, are they just going to ramp up tensions? Because all they can, all the countries, I mean, countries like France, United Kingdom, they can send ships and all that. But are they going to be able to sustain them for very long? If you want to get involved here, make sure you can stay. <laughs> don't, don't come in here, raise tensions, and then when it gets too hot, leave, right? That is, that is, that is, that is the fear, actually. So, um, so that, that's the, the general uh, worry, actually, when it comes to, 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 to ships coming in from France, from the United Kingdom and all that. You know, uh, uh, because they, they, they're not going to be able to come every other month. They, you know, it's just, you know, a big, a big, a big, uh, a big raid, really, really, really uh, actually. So, yeah, um, the, the hesitancy with outside powers, you know, is really deeply embedded in the Malaysian psyche, simply because we have this tendency of seeing ourselves as a bit, bit of a victim. We are always a victim of, of something, you know, we are, we, 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 we uh, if it's if it's uh, Kim Jong uh, Kim Jong Nam uh, uh, getting arrested, uh, sorry, uh, getting poisoned in the Malaysian airport, is it our fault? No, it's not not our fault. It's because um, the Americans and the Koreans uh, uh, and, and 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 you know, I mean, essentially, we are seen as the victim at the middle, right? Caught in the middle. Uh, if the Chinese and the Amer Americans compete, what are we? We are we are again a victim of this of this big power competition and all that. There is this 
there is this this this, this deep uh, uh, victimhood sort of uh, uh, trend. I mean, a threat in our in our you know in our perception of ourselves. So that that experience the hesitancy, you know, about having power, outside powers coming in because it complicates calculations and all that. Uh, this also informs our, uh, the Malaysian approach towards uh, patrols in the Straits of Malacca, for example. Right, uh, uh, we would prefer if it were to stay with Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Thailand. Right, if you bring in Americans and the Brits and the Indians and all that, there will be a circus, and the Chinese will want in, the Japanese will want in, and everyone will want in. Right, and it will create a very very crowded place where we lose control. You know, that's the fear, right? Losing control because everyone is there, everyone is big, more and more powerful than us. And they can determine the dynamics, and we can't. We are just there, sort of like, you know, screaming, screaming, uh, uh, very struggling at the sides sort of like saying, "Hey, don't, don't, don't!" Right. So uh, that, sorry to put it that way, but yeah, um, I, 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 I hope that answers the question. Yeah, sure, Sarah. Do you see advantages in having the UK playing a more active role in ASEAN and in the region? Um. I mean, yeah, definitely. But um, I just want to follow up on I think Sharman's point about about the fear of losing control. I think that's not that doesn't just apply to to Malaysia. I I think that applies to to Singapore as well, and probably to most, if not all, of the ASEAN states. You know, which is why we keep talking about ASEAN centrality, right? Um, but but I think Sharman's right as well in terms of you know, yes, they can't be sending ships here every other month. So if they, if these external powers want to be engaged in the region, it has to be a kind of long-term and, and sustained commitment. Um, but then the question becomes, how do they engage or be present in a way that doesn't kind of lead to tensions, and, you know, doesn't raise tensions and conflict. And um, so I think the fact that the UK has joined ASEAN is actually a good thing, um, you know, by kind of committing to, to ASEAN and, and the regional institution that, that's in this region, I think there is some kind of reassurance that um, you know, the UK, despite being a bigger power than all 10 ASEAN member states, um, is still willing right, to kind of follow the path that uh, ASEAN prefers or, or that ASEAN has set up. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, just to echo a bit uh, what Sarah uh, and Ray said, uh, yeah, I think the question of staying power is an issue. Uh, I think at the heart of it, the presence of the UK, whether in terms of military deployment or becoming a dialogue partner, isn't a game changer as many expect it will. It's not. It's just going to be reinforcing existing layers uh, that are already there, uh, whether it's about the US or about a wider European engagement uh, to the region. So it, it's not, yes, there's added value, but it's not so much that it it fundamentally change how the region uh, does business. Uh, secondly, I think the overemphasis on the military element might be reassuring or welcome for the Western powers. It's not for the rest of the region. Um, FBDA sounds good for some countries, it's not for others. I know for example, in Indonesia, some parts of the defense establishment isn't particularly happy to be reminded that we are still surrounded by FBDA. Now, this is not necessarily a uh, a, a deal breaker or that it will ruin our relationship with Malaysia or Singapore. But the fact that the UK keeps harping on it isn't exactly something we are particularly giddy about. Uh, secondly, uh, thirdly, if there is a useful role in terms of maritime security, I think the issue would be to what extent can the UK find non-military options uh, uh, to engage the region, whether it's in the form of capacity building, uh, marine environmental protection or something else, but it's certainly not sufficient to just say, we're gonna send ships and engage in FPDA and then that's it. Uh, I think there needs to be a wider set of tools uh, being promoted. And, and to some extent, it is being promoted. Um, and the engagement with ASEAN is certainly a, a part of it. But right now, uh, I'm, I'm sort of more in the camp of it's not a bad thing. It's not a great thing, uh, but it's something that we will uh, deal with. Uh, uh, and, and it's something that we would like it if it's engaging in a different way, uh, but we're not actively rooting against it. It's fine uh, uh, as an additional layer, but it's not a game changer as, as many hope it would. 
Thank you. I think we're um, coming up to the end of the hour. So I might um, ask each of you to um, perhaps um, give us your suggestion or your sense of what Australia should be doing in the region. And also, I think if it's relevant, um, what the US should be doing or could be doing better you know if you have a top sort of piece of advice for Australian or also for US policymakers about how to approach Southeast Asia I think that would be really interesting for our audience um, and I know we've got a question here from Ben Bland um, at the Lowy Institute about the paucity of Australia's high level visits to Southeast Asia um, so, you know, I think that would be one interesting thing for you to reflect on, but don't feel limited by that. Would be interested in your thoughts um, more generally about uh, what Australia and the US should be doing. So um, perhaps we'll go in reverse order from what we started out in. So that would be Evan first um, and then back to Sarah and Sharma. Um, I think two things in the short term, perhaps one is uh, for both US and Australia, I think there needs to be a way to engage Southeast Asia without mentioning China. Uh, I think there's a whole host of common interests uh, that we hold dear, whether it's about fishing, whether it's about development or or whole host of issues that uh, we've laid out uh, both bilateral uh, in terms of its agenda, uh, but also regional in terms of what ASEAN has laid out uh, from connectivity projects and all that. So there are a whole of issues that uh, the US and Australia can engage individual Southeast Asian uh, states as well as ASEAN as a whole that doesn't require um, uh, mentioning uh, the word China. Uh, secondly, I think the pandemic uh, and the economic recovery part is crucial across the board in Southeast Asia. So um, just like the way Secretary Austin, I think started his speech uh, in Shangri uh, in Fullerton uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, by hammering home what uh, the US can do on these issues, I think uh, would be crucial. Uh, because if, if the topic of discussion does not start uh, or prioritize the most pressing issue uh, uh, for regional countries, and this is not a one-off thing, I think uh, pandemic recovery and economic recovery will take uh, many, many years to come. Uh, I think uh, everything else uh, that the US and Australia would like to achieve uh, that doesn't uh, put these two issues at the top uh, uh, would be hard uh, uh, to sustain. Thank you. Well, for me, I think um, that, you know, for all we have talked about uh, in the past hour or so, um, I mean, Australia clearly has its strengths, right? It, it has close ties to the US. Um, it is seen as, as kind of like a non-threatening, um, I mean, I know the word middle power is a bit contentious in, in, in the diplomatic circles now, but, you know, ultimately it is a non-threatening, I guess, non-major power. You know, it is technologically advanced. Um, it has, you know, substantial uh, economic resources and so on. And I think all those could be used, of course, to provide, you know, very constructive support um, for ASEAN and its member states. And, and such support, you know, like Evan said, it doesn't always have to be kind of targeted explicitly at, at China or any other country. We could be talking about things like um, infrastructure building, um, COVID uh, economic recovery, uh, which I think Australia is, is already doing, uh, you know, by providing assistance to South, some Southeast Asian uh, countries. Um, so I guess, you know, um, my, my, my main point is really for Australia to play to its strengths, you know, just look at what it has um, and try and match that to what it thinks uh, is Southeast Asian neighbours uh, would benefit from the most. Uh, so suggestion number one, one, work with Japan, you know, do, do the, uh, do, you know, enhance the, 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 the alliance with the United States um, uh, that way, you know, cross, cross, uh, yeah, the uh, crossing the spokes basically. I think I think there is uh, great potential there. I think you're already doing that. Uh, Japanese are very new to this game. Uh, they can be slightly uh, uh, clumsy when it comes to engaging, uh, especially on defense and uh, law enforcement stuff. So I think uh, working with Japan will be quite good. They are willing to to put their resources uh, into this, but uh, they, they're still learning. Number two is. Uh, Please don't do the big vision thing. I mean, it doesn't work. You know, 
so so you know the Asia Pacific community stuff you know this is all the stuff that labor prime ministers like to do so much just don't do it you know uh, lib, uh you know liberal prime ministers are more practical i think i know some people are going to you know be very upset with me for saying this but yeah you know practical cooperation and all that don't don't try to reorder the 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 region just work through the eas as best as you can um uh, to 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 ben's uh, question i think yes uh, there has been some impact because of the uh, you know visits have been um, you know um it's, it's not Australia's fault, really. I mean, uh, it's just very difficult for, for Malaysia, for some other countries to accept any uh, foreign visitors. It's just so complicated, you know. Uh, it's also politically not, not, not uh, politically unwise, you know. If, if, if you've been, I mean, Malaysia has uh, 20,000 20, uh, uh, daily infections now. If we accept foreign visitors, then people are going to say, you know, uh, wh why are you taking the eye, uh, your eye off the ball, basically, um, well, when we have government. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I must say to the credit of the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur, I'm not sucking up to them, I'm just saying the, the, the truth here. Uh, they have done very well in um, building relationships in uh, uh, Malaysia. I think if um, a certain Ismail Sabri would become prime minister tomorrow or day after tomorrow, I think um, Australia will be in a very good position because they have a very good personal relationship with Ismail Sabri. Um, Thank you. That's good to know. And um, thank you to all of you for those thoughts and suggestions. Um, during the pandemic, it's a very difficult time for all of us to not be able to travel and have the same degree of sort of direct face-to-face -face, uh, contact and discussion that, um, that was previously possible. So it's been really useful, I think, to have this discussion and to get some contemporary perspectives on the Australia-US alliance. So we very much appreciate your time. Thank you very much to Evan, to Sarah and to Sharaman and um, yes, thank you again for joining the discussion. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to mention a couple of upcoming uh, US Studies Center events that our audience may be interested in. The uh, first of these is on the 27th of August, an American Cultures Lecture with Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, Professor Viet Tan Nguyen. Um, and on the 1st of September, um, a major event for the 70th anniversary of ANZUS with distinguished guests, former Prime Ministers Julia Gillard and John Howard. So please head to the USSC website to sign up for those events. Um, thank you once again to our panelists for joining and to our audience.